In my hand, I have a ball. I just love the game. Well, I've, I've, I've never been a millionaire, but I've lived like one all my life. Now, I made the right decision going to teaching because, you know, the old thing, the old saying, you know, those, those that can do, those that can't teach, you know. I'm not going to go to university. I'm not one for the books. I had no academic passion at all, so to speak. So I decided it was going to be golf. The time that we're talking about now, the late 60s, the best golfers in the world were Nicholas Palmer and player. But you had a lot of interaction with Lee Trevino. It seems like much more with him than with any of the others. Yeah, yeah, I think it just it worked out that way. I mean, um, he, uh, of course, uh, in 71, where he, he won uh, at uh, Birkdale, I finished third, Mr. Louf finished second, he knocked that woman out on the last hole and got up and down, <laughs> beat me out of But especially in the open, uh, Lee and I seemed to butt heads a, a lot. And then World Match Play Championships. Tell us the story of World Match Play going off the first tee. Well, that was the afternoon. I was, it was a 36-hole finals and I was four down. And, uh, you know, not, not uh, with a lot of work to do. And we both hit our tee shots off the first and we're going up up that little rise to where those cross bunkers used to be, they were heathery things. And he is going 100 miles an hour as usual. His <laughs> mouth never stopped, you know. And, and I was done with it. I said, Lee, this all was on camera, actually. I said, Lee, I don't want to talk. Let's just play golf. He said, you don't have to talk, just listen. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, you know, that was typical of, of him. and. Uh, and what a, what a match that turned out to be. I mean, I came out, the, but I shot 63 that afternoon and lost on the last green. Uh, I shot 29 the front nine at Wentworth and uh, I was one up and, 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 and every hole was won by birdie or eagle. I mean, it was unbelievable. And he ended up birdie in 18 and I, and, and I lost it to, uh, uh, to that birdie, uh, one down. But. Uh, and of course, he chipped in at the Open at Muirfield. It was, it was heartbreaking for you. Yeah, it was because I really felt uh, that that Open in '72 that I'd done everything I needed to do to to be in position. But of course, it's it, you know you learn it's never over until it's over. He chipped in, I think, five times during that last two rounds, and I witnessed all of them and maintained and, and stayed with him throughout. You know, got actually got got. A, a little bit ahead and uh, it did there's no doubt that it's, in terms of majors that that sort of uh, affected my confidence moving forward uh, I, I never thought that luck had anything to do with winning you know uh, I, I just thought it was about perseverance and skill and and just you know resolve and you, you get it done and these aud audacious shots that he kept on doing, you know, he, he sort of sculled one out of a bunk, bounced, bonked straight in the hole on that 16th there one day on the third round, and then um, ultimately chipping in on the 71st hole. It just shocked me to a point where uh, my, my reaction was, you know, that son of a gun, you're not going to beat me like that. And I took a rush at the putt. Uh, I, you know, I believe I could have two putted all day long. Uh, and I just hit it that, that awkward distance past and uh, missed the return and that was the end of the story. Uh, so, you know, and that was the end of really my, my major career in terms of, uh, I mean, I won tournaments, but majors I realised and recognised quite early on were the really only important ones. Tony, the Ryder Cup has been has had a huge influence on you from the time that you first played in 1967 all the way through to when you captained uh, the winning teams in the 80s. But we're at concession. So talk about 67 and 69 first. 
Yeah, well, m my first experience was in 67 at Houston, and uh, I'd, I'd met most of the American counterparts, uh, Johnny Pot, Gay Brewer, uh, guys like that were all in that team, Arnold, of course. And actually, Jack wasn't. Jack, in 67, was still not qualified to be in the Ryder Cup. The PGA of America had some crazy rule. He had to be a member for six or eight years or something before you could play Ryder Cup, but they soon changed that. And Di Reese was our captain, and I, I enjoyed Di. Di was, a, I thought he was a great captain. He was full of vim, and he was, you know, a really bubbly little guy, and he could play himself too. But it was it was very clear that America had the strongest uh, team. Uh, I think in those days it's fair to say that you know, we, we, as much as anything, our guys were in awe of of the way things were done in America. And America, and you, you took a guy like Arnold, for example, who, who gave this impression that he was taking the world by the scruff of the neck and just. <laughs> You know, he was gonna he was gonna come out tops, whatever happened. You know, and there was this sort of, I think it set, you know, it set the f a little bit of. In Britain, we weren't like that. We weren't quite that brash and 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 confident and and outgoing. You know, we we did everything more quietly and and. Uh, but then through the through sixty nine, of course, was a pivotal year at Brookdale, where where the, the concession happened, and Jack conceded the two foot putt on the last green uh, for the tie. How long? How long was that putt? Two foot. Uh, his words: uh, Since we've built this, uh, <laughs> since we've built this wonderful place, we've been together uh, on camera quite often about it. And his words, not mine: twenty twenty two to twenty four inches is is the number we both agree on that i mean some guys you know say it was three or four feet well it wasn't it was it was this far and i think i would have made it but i'm glad i didn't have to <laughs> uh, uh so that was a a pivotal year Ryder cup wise for us you know we i think i think there were 25 or six matches and 18 of them went to the last green in that uh, in in that particular year but the Jack's gesture was, uh, you know, winning. I'd won the Open at Lytham in 69, two months before. My manager, Mark McCormack, in his wisdom, I wanted to go and contemplate life, you know, and he got me back in America straight away. I was like a, I was spent. And I, that was the, what should have been the best month of my life ended up being one of the worst. I missed four cuts in a row in America. Uh, he said, you've got to go back, play Westchester. It's the biggest first prize in golf. And I thought he knew all the, he had all the answers. And, you know, because uh, he was handling all Arnold's stuff and uh, Gary's stuff at the time. And, you know, I thought he was there as an advisor as well as a sort of manager, money maker. The whole thing with, um, with Mark McCormack and IMG was a very disappointing part of your life. Oh, it really was. I mean, uh, I didn't realise until much later that it wasn't about him, it was about me. I mean, vice I versa. Know. Uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't about me, it was about him. Uh, he wanted me in Europe. <clears throat> I wanted to be in America. I should have been in America. When I won those two uh, major, major championships, it was... Uh, uh, there's no doubt I should have been in, in, in America where I could have had a, a life uh, suited myself. I was living this sort of goldfish bowl in England, you know, where you're very, uh, everybody can get at you in England. And uh, uh, I was cutting ribbons at fates and doing, trying to be all things to all people during that period where I needed more obscurity and being, uh, I need, I could have still supported the European tour because the European tour hadn't really started at this point. And that's where they used me. John Jacobs got me going back to play in Italy and Sweden and Germany and all these new territories that they wanted to move golf into. I could have still done that and lived in America and, and, and uh, the, the bottom line was by staying in, in Europe and, just, and trying to play in America, I neglected my game, you know, my, my, I couldn't maintain the hours of practice and the mindset that was required to stay on top. 
uh, and and inevitably it all sort of ended, you know, in, in that we, seventy-two was it at the open that open, but by then I was already fed up of it, you know, flying back and forth six times a year, trying to do this here and that there. Uh, it was just uh, a nonsense, and it was in the days where uh, it took a bit longer to get about than it does today. Tony, would you would you say it was a fair comment to say that um, you were much more than just a champion golfer? But you mixed with celebrities, you mixed with royalty, you mixed with all the top businessmen, and you were one of them. Yeah, there's no doubt at that time. I think you know, I was a, you know first first golfing superstar anyway, and. Uh, you know, it was quite surreal. You know, the lifestyle was was uh, magical. You know, whether it was world match plays or just eight players and chauffeur cars here and there and suites at the Savoy uh, in London, that sort of thing. It was. Uh, but I, I, as an individual, I had my feet firmly on the ground. I think. You know, I never got carried. I really never got carried away with all of that. Golf always kept you honest. You know. You, you know. You, Honing your game and keeping your game, and and if you if you get too arrogant at golf, it would pop you right back there as quick as and you 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 know uh, only too well what I'm talking about. So uh, you know golf is a, a mirror of life in many ways, and and it kept me it kept my, I kept my feet firmly on the ground, but um, the, my organisational abilities where it came to tournaments and the discipline of not playing here and trying to do getting pulled sideways by by different people and it, it it took its toll i'm going to give you some names i want you to tell me the first thing that comes to mind jack nicholas yeah great great player great friend great great guy uh our paths have crossed many times it's still still see each other and uh uh, he's been a friend to me um, ever since we met. You know, we fished together. Um, Astrid had a miscarriage when 20 odd years ago when we were at Troon. The jet, his jet, flew her down to London. Wh whatever it took. Uh, uh, Jack's always, uh, I've always considered Jack and Barbara uh, dear friends and uh, one of his captains now at Muirfield. Uh, for the memorial tournament, I enjoy going there every year and seeing him. Uh, but uh, a great champion and uh, uh, a great, great human being. He, he, he had it all figured out uh, long before most of us did. Uh, he knew. Uh, I'll never forget when I won the Open, saying to him at the prize giving, I didn't think I could be that nervous and still play. He said, I know, isn't it great? You know, that told me that he was the, that way all the time. You know, he was... Bobby Locke. Bobby Locke. Oh, what an incredible... Uh, I just consider myself so blessed that I got to see him play and play with him. And still the greatest putter I ever saw. And uh, I had this chat the other day with Paul Azinger and he said he thought Tiger was. I said, hey... He wouldn't put Tiger done, wouldn't put on greens like Bobby Locke used to have to put on, and uh, an amazing uh, mind, an amazing mind, and you know they couldn't stop him. They they tried, to, they had to ban him to stop him in in America. People don't realise that, you know, in, when he won that Tamashanta tournament, he he couldn't play all the exhibitions that they wanted him to go to because of his international obligations, and so they said, okay, well you can't play here, but but. Uh, he was an amazing, amazing golfer. That big old hook, I can see him now, master. Roberto de Vicenza. Roberto won a, 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 a delight, and uh, he always used to call me boy. And uh, when I won the Open, he said, boy, I'm glad I'm no you. I said, what are you talking about? He said, now you have to be like the boxer, like this. He says, you do this, somebody punch you on the nose, he said. And I, and I learned exactly what he meant. And then I won the US Open uh, a year later. He said, boy, now just be nice to people. You make millions of dollars. He, he always had this 
wise, wise. I played with him in Augusta in about 72 when I was really playing well. And he could see I ended up shooting one under or a par or something. We came off the 18th and he said, boy, you can't win before you play. Such wise, wise words all the time. And he was always spot on. What a gem of a guy. And uh, I love him. Sam Steed? Sam, I got to know very well. You know, tough, very tough, uh, you know, and had it tough in his early life and he was a he was a tough hombre i like sam and, and a wonderful swing and he was he was one of the guys when it came to tempo and rhythm that i always had in here you know i could close my eyes and see that wonderful tempo that sam had great character and uh, i felt better for knowing him i must say gary player probably i think again one of the, the maybe the most remarkable man i've ever met to be able to have achieved what he did in his life with his stature amongst bigger, stronger uh, men, traveling the amount of miles he's done to get it done, uh, the things he had to do to get it done, uh, uh, facing the all the stuff he had to face. Bobby Cole. Bobby Cole, unfortunate not to, uh, should have won the Open at Carnoustie when he finished 5-5. Five, five. The year of the playoff, I think. Enormous talent early on. I mean, I, our lives, I see Bobby occasionally now, but when he was 18, he had a most wonderful swing. And uh, uh, I'm not, I, I'm loath to say underachiever. I, I, I don't know quite, you know, you never know what's in anybody's mind. But as a, as a player, at a golf swing, he had it all. He, he, he really was, uh, he was fantastic to, to, uh, to watch. And we played a lot of golf uh, together, Bobby and I did, especially when we first came to America. Traveled a bit and were great pals. I, I always, uh, I've got a soft spot for Bobby Cole. He's a great, great guy, but uh, uh, certainly never achieved what he should have uh, playing golf, in my opinion.